Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. I want to thank everybody for coming out to uh, a great conversation and discussion and presentation on clean energy here in Seaside. This is a regional topic and a very, very good topic at that. Um, so first, a welcome for our host city. Uh, we want to actually introduce uh, a man that has come on board as mayor and shown tremendous leadership for downtown revitalization uh, and regional solutions to energy, transportation, and so much more. Please help me in welcoming Mayor Ian Oglesby from here in Seaside. Thank you, Steve. I'll just take a few minutes. My job is to, to give a warm welcome, and so I want to welcome everybody for being here today and taking the time out uh, to you know, talk about this important discussion about uh, clean energy. You know, you guys want to spend the next hour or so uh, talking about clean energy, and I want to thank uh, Council Member McShane for hosting this event, Council Member Friedman for his views and discussion, and our special guest, uh, Congressman Jimmy Bennett, for his leadership on this issue and other important issues. It's important that we realize that we need to figure out ways to decrease our use of fossil fuels and increase our use of renewable uh, resources. So. I think this is an important discussion. I just want to welcome everybody and say, uh, look forward to uh, listening to the discussion. If I step out, it's because I have another meeting to go to to talk about uh, other important issues at City Hall. So I just want to make sure I welcome you guys and say thank you for hosting this and having this important event here and allowing the citizens of Seaside to weigh in on this issue. Thank you so much. Tonight would not be made possible if it weren't for a sponsorship from Scudder Energy Systems. So I want to welcome one of our region's leading companies when it comes to commercial, residential, energy advisement, and all sorts of work to, to really electrify the region. And we have the President and CEO, Pete Scudder. Pete, come on down and say a few words, please. Thank you. Please help me in welcoming Pete. Thank you, Steve. It's always a pleasure being introduced by, by Steve McShane here, so thank you for, for, the, for, thank you for putting this thing on today. It's, uh, it's well-deserved, and, and uh, Seaside has really embraced clean energy. It's one of the cities that really gets it, understands the, you know, the carbon footprint of what it has to do to, to make it better for all of our lives. So it's really, it's really nice to be partnered up with a city like this. So thank you for uh, hosting Mayor who's over there. So thank you for hosting that. So, um, I actually need questions on solar. We do have a booth back there. Andrew, one of my, solar, my experts, is sitting back there as well. He's, he's here to ask or answer any questions you may have regarding solar, if it's residential or if it's, or if it's commercial. There's a lot of opportunities right now with lease programs and, and uh, PACE program that's out there. There's some there's real opportunities. As you're probably aware of, in the 2020, there's some new rules coming in, new homes. Uh, that uh, California is the only state that actually adopted this, that uh, every house that's uh, built in 2020 is going to have solar panels on it. So it's good for the industry, but it's good for the environment, and it's good for a lot of things. People talk about, well, the cost of that's going to so much, add so much cost to the house. The average is about eight to $10,000, but since you can put it on a 30-year mortgage, and it's going to, you're going to end up having a very small utility, uh, it actually it's going to pay for itself probably day one when you, when you, when you fire your, your new home up. So there's some opportunities there. You probably also realize there's some, some tax credits that are currently available. Uh, ITC, the tax credit that's available through the federal government, and this is expiring in 2022. Uh, residential goes down to zero in 2022, and uh, commercial goes down to 10%. Uh, currently it's 30%. So right now, before the end of the year, if your project is more than 5% in-house and then are being developed, you can get the 30% uh, tax credit this year if you think about doing solar. And I know Jimmy knows about a, pro a project coming on that there's a Senate, a Senate, there's a Senate bill and a uh, Assembly bill, Assembly bill. There's a House bill as well as a Senate bill that's coming up, sponsored, it's bipartisan, to extend it for five more years. So we might talk about that a little bit today. So if we get that five more, five more year extension, it's gonna help the industry that much more. Solar has grown over 10, it's grown over 10,000% since 2006 of the growth and what it's doing in billions of jobs, 
hundreds of thousands of jobs that are that are being offered because of the new solar in the industry. So we're really proud about the industry, how it's, it's grown some legs and how it's really taken over. We'll see more and more of that. So that's all I have. If you have some questions, and again, Andrew's back here for probably get probably a little deeper on some of these things than I can. So thank you. That's on behalf of the planning committee for this event. We want to thank you for your leadership and for being part of today. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. So many of us are here today because there is a concern for our climate, there's a concern for our planet long term, and as part of that, we think of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's where to certainly our mayor, to our congressman, there is this, this effort to work towards a non-petroleum dependent uh, energy source that, that really fuels everything that we do. And when you look at what we're talking about, we're talking about a lot of things, mostly the fact that 65% of greenhouse gas production does come from fossil fuels. And when you drill down even further, there is a huge amount of our energy production that's geared towards electricity. Uh, and I know that's a big focus, but even more so, more so towards transportation. According to Cal EPA, ultimately 39% of energy used goes towards transportation. And that's a big focus today, and I know we'll, we'll get a, a look at what MST is doing and certainly what our Air District is doing to, to mitigate that. Uh, there's tremendous partners here. I see AMBAG Energy Watch that's focused on conservation, our Air District that's focused on electrification, not to mention MST, certainly to discover solar and energy systems. A lot of great work here and a lot of information in the back that we'll continue to check out. So with that bit of introduction, I want to start out by giving a bit of an update on one of the most breakthrough achievements for the region, and that's with Monterey Bay Community Power. Show of hands, who's heard of Monterey Bay Community Power? Maybe half the room. It's unbelievable. Here's an organization that's been around about a year and a half now. Myself, Mayor Oglesby, Council Member John Freeman from San Juan Batista. We are board members for Monterey Bay Community Power. And I want to start out with a presentation on just a quick update on what Monterey Bay Community Power is doing. So, Tabitha, let's roll. <laughs> so the whole idea between or behind Monterey Bay Community Power is this idea that we would be able to procure carbon-free and green energy and resell it to ratepayers at or below what, say, PG&E or the other investor-owned utilities would charge. Uh, we've grown. By now, we've grown from 19 jurisdictions, adding 10 more along the Central Coast, including Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo County, to this incredible magnitude where we've been able to, to really increase uh, you know, our ability to save ratepayers' money while also introducing more green power. Let's keep rolling here. So the mission and the goals, work towards greenhouse gas reduction, be competitive at stable rates, and work on local energy investment. From the get-go, we couldn't put together something that wouldn't make sense and pencil out for ratepayers. It could be a green tax, per se. It had to make sense, and it's working. Let's go to the next slide. So as you look towards our procurement, more and more, every year we're working towards more green energy in our portfolio. This is our current portfolio. When you talk about eligible renewables versus non-eligible renewables, ultimately the, the ineligible is hydroelectricity. So working more towards wind, uh, wind, uh, solar, and geothermal. We'll go to the next one. So some of our accomplishments, as you'll see, uh, not only local jobs, but a ton of investment in our local economy in the form of incentives to, to get folks to buy electric vehicles, install infrastructure. You can see some of the initiatives in our microgrid initiatives. Uh, Director Friedman's gonna talk about that a bit as well. And our reserves, we're about two years ahead of schedule when it comes to paying off our reserves. You wanna to go to the next slide, Tabitha. So tons of outreach, this is one of them. Getting out there, getting in front of the public, doing, doing lots of outreach. People are now thinking more about where their energy comes from and what it means to flip the switch. So when it comes to savings, this is the most exciting part. So in our first year, a 3% rebate. Take a look at your mailbox in December. You'll see that. 
in the next year, a 5% rebate, and we're planning the year after that, 7%. So we've been hugely successful in that respect, saving millions upon millions for ratepayers while also working towards carbon-free energy. We'll go ahead to the next one. So our energy programs that we reinvest into the community, right off the top, we take 4%. That's electrification of the transportation network and tons and tons of policy and energy programs that work towards outreach, education, and the like. So one of the most exciting pieces to the whole thing has been our electric vehicle incentive program. And you'll learn more about that alongside the Air Pollution Control District, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District. Together, we have over a million dollars that have gone towards the purchase of new electric vehicles. That's in addition to state and federal incentives as well. So it's been really, really, really exciting. We have another program that we will be launching along with Cal EVP. That is lots and lots of resources geared towards investing in infrastructure. You know, many folks that own an electric vehicle, and I drove one here today, will say, I'm worried about range anxiety. What am I going to do? And uh, well, we're, we're overcoming that in incentivizing private development of electric vehicle charging and infrastructure investment. Uh, next one there. So there's a strategic plan and of course working towards solar on homes. You know as you'll learn from the congressman tonight uh, there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of work to be done at the federal level and one of the things that we've really really worried about is all this solar generated during the day what do you do at night? And they say it's like a duck curve. During the day we're literally having to give away energy or we're having to to pay people to take it because we've got too much of it. So working towards batteries and certainly to the leadership of uh, Mr. Scudder there, you know, all the counseling that's done to, okay, you want to install solar, you need to consider storage so that you can, you can do something with that energy at times when it's not being generated. So let's go ahead from there. So more than anything, you'll hear a little bit later about our investments and strategy towards micro -gits. I'll, I'll let Mr. Freeman get to that, but again, generating electricity where it's needed so you don't even have to transmit it any place. And on a big scale, there's tremendous benefits there. Let's go to the next one. So unifying the Central Coast, uh, there's one really exciting movement underway, and that's this idea that working with other jurisdictions, we can ultimately scale projects at a small level and uh, benefit uh, ratepayers. Okay. So that's some of the contact information for Monterey Bay Community Power, and I, uh, I hope I warmed it up for Director John Freeman. Uh, you know, he's done a tremendous job in his career on smart grids, home electrification. Uh, he's on the City Council in San Juan Batista, also a director for Monterey Bay Community Power, and he's got a short presentation as well. So help me in welcoming Director John Freeman. Good evening. Thank you, Steve, for the <clears throat> exciting introduction. Um, and the, we do sit on the board together, and it's, a, uh, it's fulfilling. It's really great to see it come to fruition. Uh, it's great. I also like to thank the Mayor of Seaside for making this great facility available. Uh, to all our vendors in the back who are supporting it, the Scudder Solar, the MST, Monterey Bay Resources District, and anybody else I forgot. Excuse me, anyway. I'll be talking about two subjects. First slide is up there. Microgrid. First question might be, what is a microgrid? And I'll give you the electrical engineer definition first, and I am not an electrical engineer. Um, but it's a group of interim connected loads and distributed energy resources with a clear, clearly defined boundary acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid, and you're able to connect and disconnect from the grid and operate independently. Let's talk English for one minute here. That means that facility or a group of facilities whose electrical load or demand is tied together and is capable of being powered by several sources of power. The example would be solar, wind, backup batteries, or even backup generators. This enables a facility to be disconnected from the grid and operate independently from the grid. So, <clears throat> as you know, uh, our primary uh, delivery is PG&E, uh, delivery vendor is PG&E, 
and they've had a lot of issues with the grid recently because of the fires, uh, the deadly fires in Napa, Sonoma, and um, Paradise. What's the town? I forget. Chico, the one above the Paradise. Thank you, Paradise. It'll forget. <laughs> Anyway, they've had a lot of problems with the grid, so they have uh, started a new program where they may disconnect entire regions from the grid, and you will be powerless, literally without electrical power, for up to three days. And so having a microgrid is a way to overcome this situation. Next slide, please. Okay, Steve already had this one, and benefits of your... <coughs> Community resiliency, it's local economy, and contributes to <coughs> renewable energy. Next slide, please. Slide three. Okay, so an example of this on a small level would be a Tesla Powerwall, where um, the sun generates electrical power during the afternoon, when, as uh, Steve so correctly demonstrated, the power is dirt cheap. At that time, you can charge your battery, and the battery is that small refrigerator looking thing that says Tesla and you charge your battery during the day and then you use that battery during the night to run your house. Okay? Also, when the power goes out, you use that same battery to run your house. So that's, that's how a microgrid can help you on an individual residential level. Next slide, please. It also helps businesses, okay? Business, the batteries are a bit bigger because their um, electrical demand is usually a lot bigger. Uh, they look like giant refrigerators sitting outside a, a, a building. And all they are is a battery, and then all they do is charge and discharge into the facility. So that's, how, that's basically how they work. So five, you might want an economic reason for doing the microgrid. Okay. And, uh, and they are dirty. You reduce peak load energy. And then what that means is there's peak demands, and Steve kind of already talked about this. That's during your afternoon when everyone's running air conditioners. Uh, that sucks a lot of power. Um, and, and, <coughs> but that's also when you can charge your batteries. Also, you can discharge to the grid from a battery system and help out your pg e or Monterey Bay Community Power, your vendor, uh, they can pay you back for that power that you charge into your battery. It helps, let's say, even out the grid. You know, because if you're looking at peak power, the power company uh, has to purchase power from someone, maybe a new plant has to be built, whether it be solar or traditional natural gas. Um, all these things cost a lot of money, and you can save money by not building that resource. Okay, slide six. Individual reasons for a business to ha uh, have a microgrid. You can still produce and ship product and pg e shuts off your power. Your business is <coughs> able to remain open. You can, uh, if you store perishable products, such as fruits, vegetables, frozen foods, these will not be spoiled or damaged. And your business is still capable of billing customers. And that's really important. <laughs> Okay, slide seven. Slide seven is building electrification. Like I said, it goes hand in hand with microgrids. Okay, and the object of that is to reduce or eliminate natural gas from your home. Okay, so you're gonna use electric appliances and they're gonna replace uh, water heaters, forced air furnaces, gas stoves, and ranges. Um, if combined with energy storage, which we just talked about, uh, the backup power can provide power to the residents of the home and what we need. Next slide. I'm going to show you what to change out. Here's your traditional gas stove. You're going to trade it for that. Okay, next slide. There's your gas heater. You're going to trade it for a heat pump. It'll look like an air conditioner. Next slide. Your traditional water heater. You're going to trade it for a much more modern, much more efficient electric tankless water heater, which provides hot water on demand. So that's what we trade out in building electrification. I don't think you give up much, and you gain a lot in uh, reliability. So let me talk about that, slide, slide 11, the last one. Um, back, let's go back, yeah, thank you. <coughs> Better not get <laughs> When you're building a new gas, um, when I'm, excuse me, when you're 
we've got to do housing development. No expensive gas lines need to be installed into the streets. Also, no expensive gas lines need to be installed into the houses. So an example of this, two months ago, the city of Berkeley just uh, said that on all new construction, there will be uh, uh, electrification of both residential and commercial buildings under four stories high. Um, last week, the city of San Jose, about 70 miles to the north of us, said it would just be for all residential homes. If, if you're building a new track, there will be no gas lines in there. You will have all electric appliances. So, so that change is being done. It's being done at the local level by local officials, officials making changes in kind of a boring thing called the building code, but it helps. It helps. Okay, so the gas lines, as you know, I live in San Juan Batista. I live 500 feet from the San Andreas Fault. So I'm living on the edge, literally. You know? <laughs> um, and earthquakes can cause gas lines to break. And this, if you have no gas lines in the street or gas lines in your home, I'm going to say your subdivision is much safer. So, in conclusion, thank you for the opportunity to shed a little light on these new concepts. And if you have any questions, we'll take them at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your leadership there. And as you can already determine, a lot of this is coming down the pike. A lot of it's being discussed by various policy makers. So yeah, I'm sure there'll be some opinions and some questions as we get to that. Uh, you know, our next speaker uh, really, truly does not need much of an introduction. Uh, I will say there has been no greater leader for our region, uh, not just on this topic, but on so many topics as we face the diversity of agriculture, tourism, and a whole host of social challenges, whether it's housing and water, uh, or, or our environment. Uh, so uh, please help me in welcoming our U.S. Congressman Jimmy Panetta for his Thank you, thank you, Steve. I appreciate uh, that, that very kind uh, introduction, Councilman uh, Freeman. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for being a part of this for so long. Um, I know over a year and a half ago when we kicked off the Monterey Bay Community Power Plan over at the City Council and, uh, Chambers in Monterey, the city of Monterey, you were there, um, uh, Bruce McPherson was there, who was a stalwart leader from Santa Cruz. John, you were there. Uh, there were a number of people there from about the area. And let me tell you, let me tell you, ever since I've been in office, starting in January of 2017, it's this type that type, our type of local leadership, which you're seeing is really going to make a change when it comes to dealing with climate change. Because I can tell you ever since I got in office from January of 2017, we've seen a threat to the policies that were put forward uh, prior to 2016, unfortunately. We saw two steps going forward, and now you see three or four steps going backwards, unfortunately. And it's been this constant, constant pushback, this constant defense that we in Washington, D.C. have been playing at this point. That's why the work of people like all of you, Councilman McShane, Bruce McPherson, John, people who are getting involved at the local level means so much to all of us in Washington, D.C. And so I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Monterey Bay Community power uh, for what they've done and for sponsoring uh, this event tonight. So thank you again. Look, it, it has been a difficult time in Washington, D.C. And I know when you turn on your TV tonight, you're going to think, well, it's, it sure seems like a threat to our democracy. Okay? We understand that. But right now, we're here because there's a threat to our environment. And we know that. And that's why we've taken time out of our evenings to come out here and see what we can do to push back. And it was appropriate because when I got my mail uh, this week, I saw The Economist had, and I don't have a fancy PowerPoint, and I apologize, but what I do have is a magazine. And the cover of a magazine, of The Economist, one, one I'd like to read, I'd recommend you all read that, read this. But if you look at this cover, you can see that these lines represent the average temperature and the change in the average temperature from 1850 all the way up to today. And we see how blue it is all the way up to 1971, and then all of a sudden, 
it starts to get darker and darker and very dark red, as we're seeing right here by my fingers, unfortunately. And what they go on to say, if I may share this with you, is that the changing climate of the planet and, and the remarkable growth in human numbers and riches both stem from the combustion of billions of tons of fossil fuel to produce industrial power, electricity, transport, heating, and more recently, computation. And so we understand that it's this output of our carbon emissions based on our lifestyles at this point is which led to the rise in temperatures, which has led to the dramatic events that we've been hearing about over and over. The wildfires, the floods, the hurricanes. It is a threat to our existence. Now, another thing what it goes on to say is, look, it's not the end of the world. Humankind is not poised teetering on the edge of extinction. Earth is a tough old thing and will survive. But it is a dire threat to countless people, displacing tens of millions at the very least. It will disrupt farms, which billions rely on. It will dry up wells and water mains. It will flood low-lying places. But the longer humanity takes to curb emissions, the greater the dangers, the sparser the benefits, and the larger the risk of some truly catastrophic surprises. We cannot wait any longer. And that is why we need to continue to push back. And that's exactly what we've been doing in Washington, D.C. Now, I know what was disheartening with an administration who pulls us out of the Paris climate, climate Accords, who rolls back emission standards, who does not listen to our scientists when it comes to dealing with this issue right here. But I can tell you that there are legislators in Washington, D.C., both Democrats and Republicans, who are actually doing something to push back. Now, mind you, many of the Republicans I work with on this issue are from states similar to California, Florida, who has to deal with the hurricanes, who have to deal with the dry day floodings, who have to deal with the rising sea levels. And so what you are seeing is members coming together, especially on the Climate Solutions Caucus, which is a group of Democrats and Republicans, even numbered about 20 and 20, who are actually finding solutions and putting forward legislation to deal with this issue and to cap our carbon output, output as best as we can. Now, we saw the threat at a personal level, to be honest with you, right out of the chute from this administration. What I mean is early in March and January of 2017, what you saw are three executive orders to infringe upon something we value so much here, and that's our Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Three executive orders which basically said they wanted to look into how they can look into sanctuaries that were created within the past 10 years in order to do mineral extraction. Oil drilling, if you can imagine. Exactly. Now, obviously, we were lucky that we had leaders before us that actually secured the Monterey Bay Sanctuary well before the 10 years. But not the Davidson Seamount, which is part of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, about 200 miles southwest of here. We, that was created less than 10 years ago. So that could be infringed upon. And so what did we do? Well, let me tell you what we did. Not last session, because there was a different majority in Congress. But this session, with the Democratic majority, we passed, just within the last month, a bill to prevent all offshore oil drilling on the coast of California, and on the East Coast as well, as well as in the Arctic. Now, it passed the House, but it's in the Senate at this point. We passed H.R. 8 as well, which basically said that if this administration is going to pull us out of the climate, Paris Climate Accords, then we are not going to pay for it. Once again, passed the House of Representatives, held up in the United States Senate. And the legislation that I put forward recently within the past month was Senator Chris Coons from, Del from Delaware and Senator Diane Feinstein from California, the Climate Action Rebate Plan, which basically 
imposes a fee on emissions of our carbon. Now, what you do with that fee, though, is you give most of it back to people who are affected by climate change the most, those in lower socioeconomic levels. But at the same time, what I make sure is that part of that part of those funds goes into our research and development for issues like you just heard John talking about, making sure that there is battery power, research and development into the technology when it comes to renewable energy, making that cheaper for everybody to have. And I think that is important. And so right now we're working on getting co-sponsors to do that. Because I do believe that when it comes to mitigating our carbon output, no better place to do that but here in California. California is number one in solar. California is number one in geothermal. California is number two when it comes to wind energy. We are the leader. That is why you see the state of California, thank goodness, push back on this administration as well, especially when it comes to rolling back our emission standards. It is why you see many members of the California delegation, led by Speaker Pelosi, continuing to push back on this administration when it comes to dealing with climate change, when it comes to capturing the carbon output that is necessary so that we turn this dark red to hopefully a blue. But at this point, we're doing what we can in the House of Representatives. As I said, a lot of those pieces of legislation are unfortunately held up in the Senate. That is why tonight, that is why the Monterey Bay Community Power Plan is so important. Because it really is going to be a bottom-up effort at this point. At this point. And that's why it's so important that we learn about what we can do to participate, not just in our, our international issues of dealing with climate change, but what we can do locally. So I look forward to answering any questions you have. Know that basically this is an effort in dealing with this issue right here that is, has to happen at all levels, nationally, internationally, but also right here locally. So thank you for being a part of it. Thank you, we have a few more slides and then we'll, we'll take questions. Obviously this is some controversial stuff in some circles. Uh, we are dealing with cutting edge, bleeding edge challenges. Now, I won't call everyone out, but I will say that in this room we have a lot of decision makers. We have the chair of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. We have a school board member. We have a former school board member. We have three council members. We have a planning commissioner for the county of Monterey. You have a lot of decision makers in this room, not to mention a few youth from the Sunrise Movement. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in this room, and I'm sure the questions and the discussion will be robust. Uh, and Eric, I failed to mention even the Community Advisory Committee of our police department uh, in the area, so thank you for being. And, and, a, and a general manager, CEO of a racetrack. Uh, so there's a lot of, and a realtor, and an insurance agent with our logo. I could go, all, and, and a chef. Um, so there's, there's quite a diverse population in this room. Uh, a few words, one more time, back to the subject of what some of the other local agencies are doing. Uh, I'm going to touch on just Monterey City this Transit and our Monterey Bay Air Resources District. Let's jump to that next slide. Yeah. So first, MST, and I want to give a shout out to Veronica. You know, she's at so many events. They are doing everything they can to electrify their fleet, to work towards zero emissions, to work towards really serving the population that needs to get from A to B and can do so more efficiently by working with other people. Uh, let's go to the next slide. When it comes to the Air Resources District, you know, this is an amazing statistic. Most of the energy that's used on the planet goes to transportation. So we have to think differently in that capacity. And our local air resources district has worked hard towards emissions reduction, administering various grants for roundabouts, signal electrification. Uh, we have David Frisbee here from the air resources district. He can speak to detail as to how your dollars 
are collected and used to help reduce emissions. You know, we have one of the best air basins in the nation, and the challenge is 70% of our air pollution comes ultimately, um, you know, thanks to, to greenhouse gas production and, and ultimately um, uh, carbon emissions. So there's a lot to be said about that. The amount of money we spent on EV charging and our electric vehicle incentive program. Next slide, Tabitha. A quick word on the electric vehicle incentive program. So phase two of that program has rolled out, and even for a used, a used plug-in, you can get a rebate. Um, I'm proud to say I, I've got a leave out front. It's a 2015, and I bought it for under $10,000. Uh, and that's thanks to, to a rebate as well. So something to be said about that. Not to mention the motorcycles, right, David? <laughs> OK, next slide. Uh, ultimately, I uh, want to recognize Scudder Energy Systems uh, for their gracious sponsorship, and we do want to open it up to questions and answers. I know there's tremendous interest in our federal government, our state government, um, and certainly Monterey Bay community power. So uh, we do have Carl here from MST. If there's any questions that can be answered, certainly our Air District community power. So um, do we want to invite the congressman back up? Is that how we do it? Do you want to just come front and center? Come on down. All right, here we go. So we'll start over there. Uh, sure. Sir, your name and uh, what is it you'd like to ask? My name is Dean Dunham. I own a multi-use building in Salinas, which I put 24 solar panels on, knowing that it wouldn't cover all the energy because one of the tenants is a restaurant. It used to be my restaurant. And uh, let me give you the mic. Thank uh, you. We're working on getting one more mic so we can hear did you hear that enough? Start again. <laughs> so I own a multi-use building in Salinas. I put solar panels on. I knew it wouldn't cover all the energy in our building, but it would make a difference. Well, it's a real challenge because of the building in the situation. Now, I understand that I've become a part of the Monterey Bay community. So I have a question, and, and I guess it's more a challenge that if we're going to move to this microgrid stage, we need to improve on the old technology of building and such. So for instance, I have a building from PG&E, and then I'm on what's called a true-up program because I have solar panels. The true-up program, they, they do not allow the option of being built on so I am billed annually. So in March, I'm going to have a $10,000 bill. And that's a difficult amount of money to manage. And there's no option. Not to mention that I have six pages of true up bill and six pages of PG&E bill. None of them are decisive. So I guess my question is, are you familiar with the, the billing? And for instance, if I'm supposed to, if, if I am on Monterey Bay, which I've been told I am, yeah, you are, that how would a rebate come? Because I probably would never know it from my paperwork. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can get that one. Go ahead, John. You can try to. Your rebate did come in, oh. in the last uh, December. It was literally just a credit on your bill. So uh, let's say 3% of. $10,000, whatever that number is, $300 would have been applied to that bill at that time. And that's how that rebate works. Each December. Each December. <laughs> so this, but this December, it's going to go up to 5%. And the next December, it's going to go up to 7%. And possibly, uh, we're also thinking about decoupling ourselves from pg e which which is the basis of your problem that you're, you're, you're upset about. Uh, they do all the billing, they figure it out on how they want to present it to you, the customer. This is just a personal opinion, that's nothing to do with politics or anything else, they do a lousy job. But, so, end of opinion. Um, <laughs> basically, um, I can't even talk to the 
I think you, I think you can call Lowry Bay Community Power uh, at the numbers that were up there on the prior slide, and there'll, there'll be so, there'll be someone there to talk to. You. Okay, I, I, and I'll make sure of that. Okay, we're trying to we're trying to get the mic, so sorry about that. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you, Carl. So, Being there, buddy. My name is Dave Warren. I have a question about distribution channels. So I'm curious to know, like certain businesses that say have food sales or battery storage, um, if energy is put back into the grid, if energy is put back into the grid, that means that you're charged a distribution the distribution charge at some point. I'm curious to know that uh, about the residential piece of it. You go to micro. I'm storing battery storage and then I put it back into the grid, right? Am I going to be charged with distribution charge on top of that? I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that question. Who does? Give him the mic. He says he can answer it. Oh, you can't answer it. Yeah. You might need to call you. So you're talking about the residential system? No, I'm, I, I'm familiar with the business aspect of it and I'm curious to know how when we, when we go to residential, if we're going to micro grid, I want to know if I'm going to be charged distribution charges for putting the energy back into the grid. Because I know that that happens now. Um, we've had that conversation with what the company just referenced that we did that. But we've already gone into that. And it gets really complicated because you're dealing with each of the and then you're waiting for your true up, and then you find out your true up doesn't, doesn't come out with what you think it's actually going to be. And a lot of that Give him the mic. Putting energy back into the grid and getting charged back on top of that. As far as I know, that as far as I know, that the uh, on the residential piece, you're getting you're getting lesser credit when you when you're producing power back to PG&E the utility. They're, they're, they charge you more when you purchase it during those during those peak periods, but when you're pushing it back, it's at a, it's at a minimal rate. But as far as I know, Andrew, you may know if, if there's a you know if there's a microgrid charge that's that's being addressed in residential. I haven't seen that, but uh, I, I haven't seen that on that piece. Of, but with, if you do a microgrid, which is a battery backup system, you're looking for a residential piece. The idea is to get past that, that true up, because they PG and change your rates structure or when when you can peak periods that you're, you're costing a lot more. They extended that. So we wanted to get past those hours between five and nine and use that battery system to be able to offset that cost. Yeah. And that, that's when you'll see the big reduction in your fee and your true up. The true up kind of, kind of sneaks up on you if, you, if you're not watching that, if you don't have a battery backup system. Would that help at all? Or? It did, but I think we're really Give him the mic. The <coughs> that's, that's the piece that we're, that we're, that Pass we're it over to him. And, and what's the name of the company you just mentioned? Monterey Bay Community Power. Yes. That, and that's what we, yes, I've already we've had a meeting with them to try to put it loaded, but it's very complicated. Yeah, so let me let me try to answer. So when folks are billed for their electricity, there is a distribution charge that is set with the Public Utilities Commission. That is one fee, and then there's the generation charge. So Monterey Bay Community Power has a hand in that, but not the distribution fee. And that can go up or go down through the Public Utilities Commission. The, the annual true up uh, is a challenge. We've heard that, and I know that Monterey Bay Community Power is working towards monthly bills and true up, if you will. I know that that's for folks that own solar and go through the headache of, oh my gosh, I've got to pay so much on an annual basis uh, if the system's not as big or, or adequate. So that, that's definitely being heard. Yeah. Um, there was a question back here again. So let me come on over with the mic. Yeah. Colleen Anderson. Um, I have just a, one question of general interest. You said that community power is getting ready to decouple from PGE or is considering it, or could you talk about that? Yeah. Decouple their rates, not, we'll never, never we'll never decouple from their their wonderful grid operation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we're, the space, it's a tri-county area, now it's actually four counties and soon to go to five. So it's huge. It, it, it's, in terms of square miles, it is just bigger than you can even imagine. So for us to take care of that, with all those blue trucks that run around, we, we, we could not do that with the present situation. So that's going to stay with PG&E. There are some cities 
namely San Francisco, that wants to do just the opposite. They want to suck in all of the, do everything themselves. Well, you know, so San Francisco is very, very small compared to our area. I mean, it's tiny. Yeah. Yeah, we work well with PG&E. I mean, they're a partner in this. They will distribute the power, we'll procure it, uh, and control the generation. So, is there a follow-up question? About the rates? I said something about the rates. About the rates. So, we have established ourselves where we would determine what PG&E is charging and, and set ourselves a certain percent below that. And that's where that 3% came from. And then we've anticipated 5% and then ultimately 7%. We are in a position where we feel we can decouple from that and give customers an even greater rebate. So that, that's, that's that, if I did a correct job of explaining it. Question right here, I'll run the mic over there. Uh, can somebody re-explain when they shut the power grid down, if you have a solar system, you're having to pay extra? Or what was the deal on that? Oh, this is a great question for Scudder Solar uh, because some folks <laughs> come on down please. because some folks uh, have a battery, some people don't oh, have a battery, and ultimately, uh, why don't you explain how that works? Because if you're connected to the grid, you don't have a battery. One thing might happen versus another. If you're connected, you get solar now, and and you are connected to the grid, which you probably are, you have solar. Uh, when you're when the power goes out, your solar goes out because. It, Pushing it back into the, into the inverter, and PG&E doesn't want to accept that power back into the lines for safety reasons. So it automatically the inverter uh, inverter uh, inverter automatically shuts down with the power coming in from PG&E shuts down either way you're, if it's receiving or or delivering. It's a safety mechanism. So the way to avoid that is battery backup or generator system. So if you want to have power when if you want power when PG&E is is, is out. You have to do a battery backup or a, gener a generator system because it's a safety it's a safety mechanism that doesn't push your electricity you're generating on your on your roof or your ground mount back into the grid system. So, okay. where's the technology? Technology is So, where's the technology? Connection, right? The technology is the inverter shuts down before it, the, the, the technology is the inverter before it, should, it before it feeds back into the grid system. But the battery knows. Battery also is all in the computer science fundamentals of Tesla batteries is that it, it knows when it's when it time to deliver power back to you. Yeah, it's all part of the program. Okay, um, here's another question. And uh, don't be afraid, you have a U.S. congressman here, so uh, this is good. <laughs> My name's Kristen, I work for Wells Fargo. I'm confused about some things, but what I want to know is if I have a battery. Am I paying for PG&E's business continuity plan? Like the microgrid, do I understand correctly that those are basically a BCP? Because that's what it seems like to me. And as a customer investing in solar power for my home, am I really just paying for PG&E's BCP? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll start with P. Um, you may have a response to that. You know, the idea of microgrids for large energy consumers are so incredible. When you think of an institution, say, like CSUMB or Dole Fresh Vegetables or the Marriott in Monterey, there's a tremendous opportunity to not have to pay those transmission fees. They are tremendously expensive. You use the transmission lines, it's based on how much power you use, regardless of how close you are to wherever you're generating that power. So from, a, from an independent business operation standpoint, it's pretty awesome. That's why we're really working hard towards that counting on our federal representatives and our state representatives to, to make that happen. Um, you know, I don't know if you have anything you had. Well, you're right. Commercial, commercial is right. You have these transmission fees. It's, it's the, and that's why you see some of these commercial projects going the battery backup system. They're trying to avoid those, those, those peak periods and those, and those trans, transition fees. Um, so with residential, it has a definitely take effect. If you, can, if you can, for your home itself, if you can, again, use the battery power that you that you put into the, the system during the day and you're pulling off of that and you're, you're virtually shutting down PG for selling the power. Does that make sense? Or did I confuse it even more? <laughs> yeah. The transmission fees are based on the amount of power that you consume. I'm 
mean, that, that's really it. And if you've got a battery, then you have all the benefit of basically There's consuming and storing the period of penalties that you're getting during certain times of the day. And that, that's yeah, I, I might take, um, I, I might, oh, there might be a question right here. And then I, I definitely want to ask uh, our congressman a couple of things as well. But um, sure, your name and any question you can have. All right, my name is Nathaniel Sawyer. I'm new to the area. I'm a leader in the Democratic Party. I'm already here. Um, NWCP member, returned peaceful volunteer. Yada yada. Military Institute, International Studies student. Long, long, long time. Um, my biggest thing, um, congressman or candidate for uh, my already supervisor. Ah, this is non -political. Non, non political. Non political event, council. but councilman. My question is for the average Joe. Um, is it cheaper to go? We know it's better for the economy. I've been to South America. I've seen the horrors of a bad economy and a, a pollution, uh, where people have to wear masks to walk around because pollution is so bad. So California is a leader in the United States in this type of sort of thing from Alabama. So I really respect where you guys are going with this. But is it cheaper for the average Joe to afford this sort of thing? Uh, I know there's a lot of individuals here with um, the, with um, solar panels and things like that, but is it cheaper for the individuals that, are, that want it, but can they afford it? It's my view. Okay, so I think that's an affordability question. And when Monterey Bay Committee Power was established, this came up a lot. Like, can, because you think about your disposable income, what you spend it on rent, food, you know, power, your energy. For some people, it's 10, 12 percent or more. So, would this be an opportunity to tax folks or creatively come up with something? So I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from both the congressman and, and the director. So let's, let's kind of vote. Um, this answer probably isn't going to make me any friends. But, so I don't have any voters here, which is good, good news. <laughs> um, the answer is it depends. Uh, there's a lot of variables in the system that PG&E has formulated. For example, if you buy an electric car, and hook up a charger to your wall or, and get the circuit installed properly, you get charged a different rate than everybody else. Okay, actually a lower rate. So we can't say, we, we can't stand here and say it's better for you or, or not better. It, everybody, it's an individual thing and everyone's got a different circumstance and you can manipulate the system in different ways, like buying an electric car. You, know, uh, you, you get cheaper PG&E rates. It's, it's complicated. We give you a three or five percent discount, and I think that is good for everybody. Period. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your service abroad, being a representative of this country in the Peace Corps. Appreciate that, and thank you for your service here with the NAACP as well as Democratic Party. Um, I think when it comes to um, obviously the trying to get involved in this and basically reaping the benefits of it. Uh, it's more of a long-range thinking, to be frank. Obviously, you can, you know, at the local level, you have uh, programs like the Monterey Bay Community Power, but I think it's basically looking at the effects of what we end up paying if we don't do anything, to be honest with you. What we end up paying for the, you know, wildfires, for the hurricanes, for the flooding, and the damage from all those, which we're paying now from what we've seen within the past couple of years. And so it's sort of a long-range thinking, and that, but it's also... When, I, when you look at my climate rebate action plan that I introduced, you're not only capping carbon, or excuse me, you're not only putting a fee on carbon. What you're doing is in taking some of that fee and giving it back to the average Joe, giving it back to the people who are affected the most by climate change. And at the same time, though, like I said, and this is why I wanted to sign on to this bill and basically introduce this bill, because it also puts money into research and development. So that, therefore, the technology can then be applied for everyone. Everybody can benefit for cheaper technology, especially when it comes to battery powers, especially when it comes to uh, eventually maybe capping our carbon as well. And so I think you've got to look at it not just immediately, which I get, and we all are, but I think you also got to look at the long-term plans, and that's why we're trying to put forward policy that deals with long-term benefits, uh, basically keeping our climate either at the same or reducing it, but at the same time we can do that by putting a fee on emissions, eventually learning how we can cap emissions that's basically economically feasible for everybody involved. Um, 
Um, you know, one other point to be made for seniors and people on fixed income, the state programs that have always been in place uh, for folks that, that, are, that are struggling in that sense still exist. So PG&E's programs, if you will, or Southern California Edison's programs, if you will, are still in place. So let me one more thing. Yep. There, and when I get back to Washington, we're on a two-week break right now from D.C. Thank goodness, especially all that's going on in D.C. It's good to be back in the district, especially having conversations like this. But when we get back in November, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee is the committee that's in charge of all revenue. Therefore, we deal with taxes. Therefore, we deal with tax credits. We're actually going to have a markup, so they say, in November sometime, in regards to certain tax credits dealing with green energy. So electronic buses uh, is one of them, Carl. You'd be happy to hear that. Uh, solar panels, getting the five-year extension on the tax credits for that. And there's also companies, uh, about three weeks ago, I was down in Chular putting solar panels on a house by a solar company that was voluntarily giving those solar panels to low-income individuals, low-income homeowners, but they were doing that. So there are other organizations, not only you're dealing with the tax credits, which we hope to pass the House, and hopefully the Senate passes that as well, and the President signs it, but also there are other companies that are looking out for the average Joe as well, willing to give, provide solar panels for your own. I want to get to two more questions. Well, the, the two things I wanted to quickly add is that Monterey Bay Power is participant in low-income solar uh, pa panels. That we are doing quite a bit of that. It, it was on one of Steve's slides. He went pretty quickly over it. But we are trying. You know, for a long time, the solar industry has just been for people who own single weapons, R1 housing and planning speed. You know, detached homes. And, and same with EV cars. It was just for people who owned, you know, apartment dwellers couldn't really have it. They couldn't charge them at night and, and things like that. So we're trying to change that, and that's going to make it better. The other thing is I want to say that Monterey Bay Community Power is investing in Moss Landing in a large utility-scale battery backup type of uh, plant that's going to hopefully provide power <clears throat> without, uh, you know, any CO2 burning of fuels for the future. Okay, I know we are rapid fire on a few questions here. I saw someone in the back and then here. So let me go to her first, and then we'll come up and we might even round this out. So just a quick question. Uh, that um, you know, everyday Joe kind of question again, what are the kinds of things can we do to be supportive of the pushbacks? Because uh, those are things that we can all do, be supportive of. But what kinds of suggestions would you have? to encourage the Senate, because you feel pretty helpless down here, other than cheering on the locals doing the right things. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess that's the question I've been looking for, because I'm listening to the Sen radio, watching the same television. It's a real challenging time in our federal government. So offer us some inspiration. How can we get involved? Are we going to be around next year? <laughs> Look, I, I think we, we are so fortunate to have had local leaders who were absolute champions when it came to per putting up the proper protections for this area. We understand that. That's why we have the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. That's why we have Fort Ord National Monument. That's why we have Pin Pinnacles National Park and, and a lot of other parks that we have here. We appreciate our environment. We appreciate what we need to provide to our future. Now, however, although we have those marks, my wrestling coach always told me this. He said, once you make your mark in the world, watch out for those with the eraser, okay? And right now we have a lot of people with some big erasers. Now, I can tell you, they're not in California. They haven't been here on the Central Coast. We have leaders on the Central Coast who understand what it means to not only protect our, env our environment, but to make sure we have sustainable energy going forward. That's why we have the Monterey, Monterey Bay Community Power Plant. Okay? But at this point, you have to realize that it is other parts of this country where there's pushback. And so, uh, yes, I know, understand that you may feel helpless here, how lucky we are to be here and feel that way, because we know we have our supporters and stalwart representatives fighting for you, especially when it comes to our environment. But we need to make sure that those in other parts of this country understand that they have to hold their representatives accountable for not acting. 
for not carrying the torch that needs to go forward into our future. And so, yes, vote, register to vote and vote, okay? But to ensure that if you know people in other parts of this country that are not voting, that have representatives that haven't stepped up and stepped forward and fought for basically the policies that we need in order to push back on climate change. Those are where I would, those people are who I would contact, making sure that they vote and that they hold their elected accountable. So it's not just here, it's making sure we go to other parts of this country as well. Well said, thank you, Congressman. Uh, we need you involved, we need to hear from you. Um, and there's contact information in the back. So um, go ahead, a quick question here. Uh, Tony Butcher, I was in the U.S. Navy for a while. I was fortunate enough to be based in Australia for a couple of years on their central coast, which is environmentally very similar to ours. Uh, they constructed some renewable energy projects, and one thing that they did was they built them in tandem with water production. Uh, so my question is on strategy and vision. Is there any discussion about expanding the renewable energy to consider things like desal, especially in light of I'm hearing that uh, there's, there's potential for excess production during the day. It might be an opportunity for it to go. So is there any discussion about to expand this into consideration of water production? Sure. Um, we'll see what the congressman has to say. I will just say my experience with government, and I've been 14 years now in local elected government, I would say oftentimes we're not thinking together and working together. You know, the city of Salinas or the city of Seaside or the county of Monterey, it's easy to wear blinders, to show up. I mean, look at all that the congressman has to review and make decisions on. I mean, there are so many topics, and I would say the same about local issues. So raising that sort of coordination here is key. And if you want my take on how this region moves forward, it's efforts like Monterey Bay Community Power, where 19 jurisdictions are working together. Counties, cities, it's like dogs and cats sleeping together, if you believe it where you get people at the table to discuss collectively, well, wait a second, it's not just wastewater, it's not just electricity generation, it's not just electricity storage. Uh, it, it's hard. You know, if I can get on a soapbox for just a second, my greatest challenge is that the average American is spending three hours, adult American, three hours on a tablet or watching television. It's amazing that you all showed up. As my friend Helen says, it's not your right, it's your responsibility to get involved. And the more people that get involved, the better the result. And at the end of the day, that sort of coordination, that sort of question, that sort of thought is only the kind of thought that someone like Potatoes had come up with that's still in his junior year of high school. So, you know, don't get me started. <laughs> um, I don't know if we need to add any more there. We got one more question here in the front. We might have time, Eric, because I'm sure you'll have something good to say. Sure. My name is Tim McGregor, this is a question for the Congressman. Yes, sir. With transportation, the electrification of both the, the automotive industry and transportation in general, is, is the nationwide infrastructure uh, to reduce uh, range anxiety, is that a federal thing or is that going to be left to the states? When you say, well, look, I, I think that infrastructure, infrastructure is something that we should have been working on at the first day I set foot in office, to be honest with you, investment in our infrastructure. Now, um, it's unfortunate that we have yet to have any serious discussion because look, it's bipartisan as to the need for infrastructure investment. We know we need to work on our roads, we know we need to work on our vehicles, we know we need to work on our water, making sure we have safe water, we know we need to work on our bridges, our airports, and so on. Across the board, bipartisan. It's how you pay for it, is the issue. Now, the easiest thing to do, to be honest with you, is what I've heard, is to have another gas tax. Easiest thing to do. Now, we in California have done that. In fact, we actually stepped up and voted to make sure that it's not repealed in the last election, okay? But there are other jurisdictions where that doesn't work, to be frank. And you may have some in California say, I don't want to pay more in regards to a gas tax. But then let's think about that. Let's try to do basically maybe a sunset on it or something like that. It's these types of ideas that you have to have. Unfortunately, and I'll be frank, these types of conversations are not happening, happening in Washington, D.C with the leadership that needs to have these conversations. Now there are other options as well, like a vehicle's mile travel. So even though if you have one of these clean energy cars, it's based on how many miles you travel. Now that, it's how you implement that, is the big issue. You might be able to do it in trucking and those types of cars, business types of cars, but the personal cars, there's obviously some privacy issues. 
But there's also also the, the fact of how do you do it? How do you monitor? Are people going to allow that and things of that nature? There are plenty of ideas when it comes to infrastructure investment. It's just how you pay for it. And right now, um, I believe that coming up, you will see in 2020, the Democrats in the House of Representatives put forward a bill to pay for infrastructure. Um, it just depends if we actually hopefully have a conversation about it with this administration and with the Senate in order to put it forward, which I'd be all for, and I think we do need to have that conversation. So like I said, it's not necessarily about infrastructure, it's about how you pay for it. That's the big issue right now in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we got to got to close this up, bring us home because I know the congressman's got to go, and and I know everybody has other plans. Uh, we have some information in the back. Uh, if you want your selfie with Jimmy, now's your chance. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, truly, this topic's important. It is a bit edgy. It's a bit difficult, and at times complex and hard to comprehend as we may have picked up on. So, you know, we'll look for future events at the regional level, future activities. I think we need to thank Jimmy for his service. Uh, you are here. And also want to thank, uh, everyone get together for a quick picture. So, well, I want to thank uh, also John Freeman. So with that, we'll, we'll come on up and say hi if you want. Thank you very much. Steve McShane, soy del concejal de Sabinas, distrito número 3, y soy de la organización de Monterrey Bay Community Power. Ok, este, ¿me podrías hablar un poquito de qué, qué, qué fue lo que estuvieron discutiendo el día de hoy y por qué es importante para las personas de aquí de la Costa Central? Hay muchos cambios en energía. Hay nuevos clientes de Monterrey Bay Community Power y muchas personas que son muy, muy interesantes que quieres pagar menos y queremos una planeta más limpia. Y, y este evento es una oportunidad para hablar de todo. Ok, y por ejemplo, si alguien estuviera interesado en energía, en ese tipo de energía, o de hacer como cambios, ¿en dónde se puede comunicar? Ahora en esta región estamos comprando más energía verde. Y hay muchas preguntas y mucho interesante a esta noche a los vehículos electricidad, de, de electricidad. Y entonces ahora hay incentivos para este vehículos y, y muchas pre preguntas en este área. Entonces, uh, muchas ideas para el futuro también. Okay, y por ejemplo, ¿qué, ¿qué cambios ha tomado la costa central en cuanto al, en cuanto al, al cambio climático de obtener más energía este verde? So, tenemos una nueva organización sin PG&E. So, entonces, con Monterey Bay Community Power, Estamos comprando energía verde, más uh, mejor para la planeta a precios más bajos. Eso es un nuevo programa para electricidad y muchas preguntas de la gente. ¿Qué es la diferencia? ¿No queremos apagar más? Eso es la verdad. ¿Cómo beneficia esta nueva compañía a la población? La nueva compañía se llama Monterey Bay Community Power y hay muchos beneficios. Todo de la administración es local y hay muchos programas nuevos para las personas que no tienen mucho dinero para comprar vehículos uh, de, de electricidad y otros beneficios, muchos programas para la comunidad, para educación y, y otras ideas uh, para más infraestructura, electricidad para, para pública. ¿Algo más que te gustaría agregar? Ahora hay muchas preguntas de la planeta, cambios del estado, de federal. So, esta noche hay muchas preguntas a yo y del Congreso. ¿Qué es en el futuro para la planeta? Hay muchas personas que, que piensan que la planeta es importante, pero <laughs> la billetera es importante también. So, eh, la punta, el punto es para un sistema local que, que tiene ideas para la billetera y para la planeta. You know, can you tell me a little bit about you know what happened here today, you know, and how it benefits um, the inhabitants from Monterey County? Esta reunión es una un conversación de energía. 
hay muchas preguntas de la nueva compañía para electricidad en esta reunión, Monterey Bay Community Power. Entonces, esto es un cambio. Toda administración de local y otros programas para vehículos de electricidad y infraestructura para mejor uh, eficiencia. So, entonces, esto es una oportunidad para, para educación y, y entender más. Uh, Okay, um, just one th there's just one thing that you didn't tell me and it was like, if anybody is interested on any of these programs that you're offering, is it like a phone number, email, oh, sí, or...? Tengolo. Cuando hay preguntas de la nueva compañía de electricidad, va a llamar a 641 6222 a 641 62 22. Y ahí pueden preguntar sobre todos los programas que están ofreciendo. Todos los programas que estamos ofreciendo eh, es, en, es en este número o a Monterey Community, Monterey Community Power. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias. That was great. Cool. Thanks.